We already have some existing outbreaks, Ebola in eastern Congo, Tenge in the Americas, pockets of measles outbreaks scattered throughout sub-Saharan Africa. But we can imagine the number of outbreaks, the number of multi-outbreaks possibly increasing over these next several months. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to COVID-19 Heroes. I'm your host, Lorraine Schneider, and today I'm joined by Dr. Solomon Kwa and Trevor Rhodes, who both work for the International Medical Corps. The International Medical Corps is an agency that provides emergency relief to those struck by disaster, no matter where they are, no matter what the conditions, working with them to recover, rebuild, and gain the skills and tools required for self-reliance. Both have responded to high-level humanitarian emergencies such as conflict, outbreaks, and natural disasters, both in and outside of the U.S. Today, they explain the inner workings of delivering global aid for COVID-19 and speak to the differences and similarities of helping domestically and abroad. Hi, Trevor. Hi, Dr. Kwa. Thank you for being on today's show of COVID-19 Heroes. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Could you please provide us with the background of the International Medical Corps, how long it's been around, where you're active, how you decide if and where you respond, and all of these things? Sure. So International Medical Corps uh, was founded in, in 1984. So we've been around about 35 years, and we were actually founded by uh, volunteer doctors and nurses out of UCLA. And uh, we're sort of unique in the international uh, nonprofit uh, organization realm uh, in the health and medical field because we do not have any political or religious affiliations. Over the years, we've operated in about 80 countries and provided uh, more than $3 billion in total aid. Uh, and today, we operate in about 30 countries. And, and those include both uh, disaster countries, uh, so impacted by sudden onset disasters, as well as those that are uh, impacted by complex humanitarian crises, uh, otherwise known as war. So we, we operate on a regular basis in places like Syria, Yemen, Somalia, and Nigeria. Um, internationally, uh, we're, we're quite large as far as a workforce goes. Uh, we're over uh, 7,500 employees. Um, but that is mostly local hires. One of our core tenets uh, as an organization is really to build the local capacity of the community that we're serving. And so we, we really limit our, um, we call them expatriate staff, but those staff that are from our, our global headquarters in Santa Monica, uh, D.C., the U.K., and, and Croatia. And uh, to your question, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to, to uh, Dr. Kwa. But um, on your question about where do we decide to, to respond, uh, we get that a lot. Uh, we get it from our insurance companies, and we get it from our donor base and, and the, uh, the emergency management community that we work with on a regular basis. And I think for any emergency manager out there, they'll understand that it's, it's, a, it's more of an art form than it is a science, although we do use, uh, we use a lot of science in, in coming to decisions. But uh, essentially, if you boil it down, it, it works out to be a matching of the humanitarian need that exists with our core capabilities. So we always want to make sure that if we enter a disaster uh, arena, that we're bringing a capability that's going to be a benefit to the community and we're not going to be a burden in any way. And so it might be looking at a specific subset of what we do as a, as a, a health and medical agency, or it might be bringing uh, multiple service lines into a response uh, to really provide that holistic health and well-being um, service that we like to provide. Dr. Kwa, why is an international humanitarian aid organization with 35 plus years of experience in difficult and dangerous environments responding to COVID-19 in the United States? That's a good question, actually. Um, you know, as Trevor was saying, uh, International Medical Corps is a kind of a global humanitarian organization, but one of its uh, strongest or, you know, kind of focused pillars would be kind of in health. And one of the aspects of health is uh, kind of almost particular on-ground experience in outbreak management. If you can imagine, like in developed countries, though, you know, many of these uh, places, they have a strong public health infrastructure. They have also good infection control uh, measures. So in some ways, in an everyday or a steady state basis, communicable diseases and when they reach levels of emergencies, such as an outbreak, are kind of a little bit, they're rarer 
even more rare is when this event or this outbreak can actually exceed the existing capacity of that state or country, especially this developed country. Right now, this COVID-19 response has exceeded you know, the U.S.'s kind of capacity and globally, hence reaching its declaration as a pandemic. And so, you know, interestingly enough, in, in a lot of the places that International Medical Corps works in the global humanitarian setting, this kind of perfect storm of, you know, events uh, outstripping local capacities, it actually happens uh, on a regular basis. And International Medical Corps' kind of, you know, natural function as a humanitarian kind of health organization, in a way, we've kind of gathered an extensive amount of kind of on-ground experience in preventing and managing and responding to outbreaks. Uh, you know, some of these could include the uh, large Ebola outbreak in 2014, uh, measles, uh, polio, cholera. These are all kind of very, very uh, common outbreaks that we find in the global sector. Uh, many of these outbreaks from the technical standpoint and principles are very similar, but are very kind of fluid operationally, depending on what kind of context you're, you're, you're working on. It's more complex. It is very multidimensional, depending on whether or not you're working in a developing context or a developed context, urban you know, versus, versus rural. There is just a compass of this kind of technical experience and principles that you apply. So probably operating within our home base, the United States, is a relatively new context than uh, we are traditionally uh, used to. We have been able to kind of apply many of these kind of primary technical principles and then to use that in this context in order to organically uh, develop an operational delivery and intervention at that point. So in some ways, it's, it's the experience that we have kind of in the field that then um, can be kind of adapted and then applied to the U.S. setting. And in what ways does the COVID response you're currently leading in the U.S. look similar or different from your COVID response elsewhere in the world? Uh, that question does kind of connect quite quite well to the previous question. Again, again the technically the principles of kind of isolation and outbreak management they're, they're they're relatively consistent. What is often the variability and the challenge is trying to operationalize and act on these principles in different contexts. So the denominator they use, the compass that we use, are the you know, principles of infection prevention control, disease cohorting or grouping, and the preservation of our supplies. One of the key supplies would be personal protective equipment, as this relates directly to also staff protection. If we don't use these principles, it is quite easy to get lost when the infectious disease reaches a level that it actually you know, overruns and outstrips regional capacities. And without maintaining these principles, it allows actually the disease to kind of run rampant through really just like any population, whether or not it's a uh, population with developed infrastructure you know, versus less developed kind of infrastructure too at the same time. But I would say probably in truth, though, you know, the, the respect really just kind of goes to the virus and nature. Because as we see it time and time again in the field, for example, in Ebola in 2014, the virus oftentimes will do what it wants to do. We use some of these principles and these technical capacities in order to try to flatten the curve as much as, you know, as, much as possible, while the virus and, and, and nature itself will, will run its course. Just to add to what Dr. Kwa is saying about the, the technical principles that we apply um, both internationally and domestically, um, the model of engagement has also been uh, very similar for us internationally. Um, anytime we go into a response, we always work with the jurisdiction having authority, as we would know it domestically. Um, and typically in, in an international context, we're working with the country's uh, Ministry of Health. And we do that in, in conjunction with conducting a needs assessment uh, that will be our staff going out to um, healthcare facilities and communities and and working with other international NGOs to identify what those on the ground needs are. And I think we've applied um, sort of that model very similarly here in the sense that we, you know, we're, we're deploying medical volunteers across state lines. And so it's, it's always incumbent upon us to work with uh, the jurisdictions to make sure that license reciprocity has been approved and um, that we have, you know, authority to distribute PPE or medical devices or whatever it is, and getting um, MOUs in place with those hospitals that we're supporting directly to ensure that, you know, everybody has 
all, all the uh, all the paperwork done ahead of time. And so, um, you know, we've really worked since 2017 to build out the capabilities that we deliver in the U.S. Uh, when we saw that the health and medical system, you know, ESF-8 was really stretched then in 2017 with all the hurricanes, and we were asked to bring some of our capabilities to the U.S. And ever since then, um, we've grown, um, you know, year over year with with hurricanes and other domestic responses. And and I think you kind of see this come to fruition now where we're able to apply, uh, as Dr. Qua said, in a highly you know, a resource rich environment and a highly structured emergency management system, we're still able as an NGO to provide value and really deliver impact at the community level that adds to uh, all the the resources and the management that's occurring at the, the local state and the federal level. With a global pandemic come, comes a lot of challenges, including flight restrictions around the world, global PPE shortages. How has the International Medical Corps been able to overcome those challenges whilst responding to COVID? It's been a challenge for us, uh, <laughs> as it has everybody. Uh, everybody's after the same stuff and the same, the same source of manufacturing was was impacted. Uh, luckily, we we have an amazing global logistics supply chain capability, and it's a collection of individuals that are highly experienced in this, and they do it in resource poor environments around the world every day. And so, uh, we were very quickly able to do an assessment of um, all the missions that we have around the world, and through some very fantastic work uh, at the local level and and then up at the, the headquarters level. They were able to quantify uh, the burn rates of our PPE, and then we were able to look at a sort of business continuity model and prioritize based on a UN system, what are the really the life-saving, the critical services that we deliver, and then what services can we defer or modify the delivery mechanism to conserve that PPE? Um, because you have to still continue to deliver babies, and you know providing mental health and gender-based violence intervention is important, but we've developed models to take those uh, into a virtual space. And so we've conserved some of the otherwise uh, PPE consumption there. Just to kind of, uh, um, you know, add to some of the say kind of on ground efforts that, uh, um, that we have at the same time is that uh, in some of the, in many of the contexts you work, we work with uh, globally intrinsic in them are kind of uh, resource poor conditions and the ability to kind of adapt uh, utilization of resources to kind of approach, uh, 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 fit the context itself. And some of the things that we've been able to work with um, in partnership with uh, uh, many of our uh, um, clients kind of on ground is how to adapt uh, many of their, you know, usually kind of standard processes and adapt them to uh, the restrictions that we find in some of our shortages, such as in PPEs. Both of you have different backgrounds. How does this response compare to any previous responses that you individually have been a part of? Yeah, it's it's tricky. At least, you know, from my background, I've had uh, quite a few years, uh, mostly kind of in the field, responding to various outbreaks. And really, most of the times out there, they're multi-outbreaks. Uh, it'll be a combination of uh, measles and polio or uh, measles and cholera kind of at the same time. And with these kind of exercises, as we were saying a bit you know, earlier, many of the principles are, are quite the same. The challenge is just trying to ensure these principles apply in the kind of variable sociopolitical context we have. And so it's not really one answer. I would say it's probably the same and it's quite a bit different from my previous outbreak responses. Trevor? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, you know, so I'm I'm a part of our emergency response unit for the agency, and our mission is really you know early alert and warning, and then early response. And typically, we'll we'll go in, we'll deploy um, where we don't have local capability to manage the response, or it exceeds local capacity to manage, and, and we'll we'll do the assessment, and we'll we'll set up the program design, and and do all the back end work. And with this one. Because the response isn't isolated into a single like trouble bubble, right? Like it's everywhere. It, it's really caused us to work from a sort of a whole of agency response. And we've spread out, we've, we've pulled in other members of the, of the organization to manage the regional application of, 
of our response programming, uh, as Dr. Kwa said, because what's really important for us and we hold as a value and a principle is making sure that we're providing uh, the right intervention to the right people at the right time. And, and there, it requires some contextualization of the local need. And so um, having individuals like Dr. Kwa that can come in and they understand the local system and, and they can work with partners in the field on an ongoing basis so that we're able to modify our response needs in real time has been absolutely critical because we're, we're working not only in our pre-existing uh, missions around the world, but now, you know, we're working in Chicago and Detroit and New York and Los Angeles and Puerto Rico and all these places simultaneously. And so it's, it's caused us to really um, bring in everybody into our sort of emergency response unit in a, in a unique way. And going off of that, so whilst COVID is ongoing, all the other diseases that you're you're trying to, to tackle, they're not going away. How is that balancing going or that reprioritization of your resources as an agency to continue serving the programs that you have year round while leading a global response as well? It's been tricky. I think the, the thing that really stood out and has been effective for us was early recognition of, of the risk for a global pandemic and early planning. We were tracking this in December and in early January, we put out a lot of, of planning meetings and discussions and looking at um, what the needs were. And, and so we worked with our technical unit to identify unique approaches to adapting our service delivery. Um, and then we worked with our staff. Um, we have a lot of dedicated staff around the world, and some of them chose to stay in place um, knowing that lockdowns were occurring. And so we still have staff, international staff that are in these locations like Syria and Jordan and Yemen and, and other areas that are extremely locked down. And they can't they can't get home, even though their original commitment that they made uh, for their volunteer or their work um, has expired. We, you know, we were working with them because um, they've graciously and courageously requested to stay. And so it's it's looking at what happens with medical evacuations when uh, you can't get somebody a, a flight home if um, they have, you know, a need themselves or if one of their family members has an urgent need. So there's been really a lot of balancing there, but it's been trying to, wherever possible, ensure that the continuity of the program for life-saving services uh, as, as much as, as, as possible. And we've done that through early planning and then pre-positioning of resources as available. Yeah, I'd like to, you know, echo what Trevor was saying. I mean, it, it, the preparation, the mitigation and the pre-positioning is, 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 is really critical to any kind of, you know, large scale emergency or crisis, uh, whether or not it's a conflict war or in this case, kind of an you know, outbreak and pandemic. Even in, in a smaller kind of geopolitical kind of environment, when we respond, one of the key priorities is always to establish outbreak uh, prevention and mitigation strategies and then uh, kind of outlining response ahead of time. But like kind of Trevor was saying that while the outbreak is actually happening, we, you know, we still need to deliver babies. We need, still need to ensure that immunization coverage you know, is in place. So we see time and time again, outbreak after outbreak, we try the best we can to try to prevent it because consistently when the outbreak actually happens, we have to kind of adapt in a way where it does challenge many of our other you know, uh, programs. With a global pandemic, it has that challenge kind of in a kind of in a whole of the organization sense, whereas kind of Trevor was describing, we, we uh, need to kind of shift, really look back kind of at the resources that we have right now what we do need to find, you know, define as kind of essential and still need to continue in the process, knowing full well that uh, the secondary effects of the outbreak are going to have an effect across kind of the organization and all the programs that we have globally. So what do you foresee for the next six to 36 months? Are there any regions in the world that you're particularly concerned about? I'm glad you asked this question. This, uh, um, I would say that you know, even from a personal sense, is that this question is like very important to me. And also probably from the organizational sense, I would say many of the places that we are concerned about are essentially many of the regions that International Medical Corps is working in and has been working for several years. We are likely coming out as we are 
coming into 2020 with an existing crisis, the coronavirus COVID-19 crisis. But as we start to kind of look back at 2019, we are realizing that we're coming out of a slightly difficult year where a number of regions, you know, particularly areas like in sub-Saharan Africa or the Southern Americas, um, they have deteriorated a bit in their health indicators. Um, some of the regions that we've had high levels of food insecurity are also same areas that have shown decreases in immunization coverage. Uh, many of these are because of existing contexts around them, whether it be natural disasters, um, environmental challenges, uh, and even conflict. And if we now add the COVID-19 pandemic, you can see this almost kind of perfect storm that we see coming in these areas. And with the challenges in operating in these areas, we can, we can see that storm brewing in these areas for several months to years. We can imagine kind of further deterioration of food insecurity. We may even find pockets of famine states in, the, in, 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 in areas. We already have some existing outbreaks uh, out Ebola in eastern Congo, Dengue in the Americas. Uh, we still have pockets of measles outbreaks scattered throughout sub-Saharan Africa. But with decreases in immunization coverage, maybe increases in undernutrition, malnutrition, uh, we can imagine the number of outbreaks, the number of multi-outbreaks possibly increasing over these next several months. Yeah, and I would just add to that that in the short term, in addition to all, all the concerns that Dr. Kwa just mentioned, incidents and prevalence rates of gender-based violence and other you know, issues surrounding women, infants, and children, uh, we think are going to become exponentially higher. You know, like in Somalia, where we work, there's a lot of concern uh, just because of um, pre-existing, as Dr. Kwa was mentioning, pre-existing socioeconomic context that's going to lend itself to these situations. And then, um, you know, there's already been some reports coming out of China of increased divorce rates. And, um, you know, divorce rates are one thing, but uh, gender-based violence behind closed doors and incidents of uh, mental health needs and psychosocial support. Uh, I think we're we're really probably just right on the edge of seeing what the the true situation uh, for those needs is. So, talking to a, a few healthcare professionals, in a way, this has kind of given them a taste for broader disaster response experience. So, Trevor, who can join your cadre of volunteers with the International Medical Corps? We work uh, around the world and we primarily provide health and medical services. And so we really try to recruit. We have a roster for uh, health and medical providers. The bread and butter of any response, especially in um, North America, Latin America, that kind of region, are, are nurses. They are the backbone of, of the health and medical system. So we, we try to recruit a lot of, of RNs physicians assistants, you know, nurse practitioners, as well as physicians. So we, we, do, um, we do quite a bit of recruiting, uh, both in, domestically and around the world, for, for the medical positions that we need. But in addition to providing direct medical care, uh, we also do things like water sanitation and hygiene services, um, mental health and psychosocial support, and a, a host of other initiatives, uh, food security, and so we also recruit for individuals who are experienced logisticians, uh, emergency managers who we can plug in for large responses as, as a program uh, manager who can oversee multiple teams that are providing interventions in something like uh, medical need shelters. And, you know, additionally, I would say we are also looking in a less kind of tangible sense, looking for a real kind of spirit of humanitarianism and, and a spirit of, of, of capacity building. And that's kind of, uh, you know, really kind of in, in core of anybody that we'd be looking for in, you know, in joining. With the International Medical Corps, you know, one of the key principles of activities that we have is to acknowledge that oftentimes uh, the region that we're working in, the providers there are actually the first responders and we come in afterwards. And as a result, that time there is actually your prime opportunity to work with who are going to be the the, the true responders of any crisis that comes, you know, in the, you know, in the future, and having that spirit of humanitarianism, having that spirit of of teaching and and capacity building, is 
really kind of be going to be at the core of what we would be looking at for anybody who who uh, comes or decides or has a um, um, has a, um, even just an, an inkling uh, to work with the International Medical Corps. So as this podcast is all about highlighting our COVID-19 heroes and sharing their stories, I wanted to ask the both of you, who is somebody that that you're really thankful for who is a COVID-19 hero in your eyes? One of the groups of people that I, I admire the most is those who are working in, in government positions uh, that can stick it out. They are service oriented and, and they see through um, through the need and, and have established programs that all of us rely on that we don't realize. So uh, Kristen Finney is uh, one of my COVID heroes and she is the, uh, the brains and the brawn behind the EM Power program. She is an amazing public servant and, and she represents a whole group of individuals. They stand their corner of the fortress and, and they've built programs that we all rely on and make the entire system better and more equitable on a, um, on a daily basis. From my role with the International Medical Corps and in this response is working uh, face-to-face with a lot of the first responders. Uh, and I would say on a regular basis, uh, I, I meet a new hero who are on the front lines. These front lines can be at the hospital or even the pre-hospital uh, level or even some of the long-term care facilities. Dr. Kwa, Trevor, thank you both so much for being guests on today's podcast. I truly appreciate everything that you and your colleagues and everybody around the world with the International Medical Corps is doing to help on the front lines of this response and in other medical capacities. Thank you. Thank you so much for the time. And it's really a fantastic project to capture in real time this experience that we're, we're all going through. I think this is an amazing, uh, amazing project. Thank you, Lorraine. I'd like to close off this episode by thanking Trevor, Dr. Kwa, and the rest of the International Medical Corps staff and volunteer cadre. They truly are global humanitarians, saving and touching people's lives in all parts and regions of the world. To find out more and support the International Medical Corps, visit internationalmedicalcorps.org. As always, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. You can subscribe to it on all major podcasting platforms and follow it on Twitter and Instagram at COVID-19 underscore heroes. Stay well, stay healthy. Thank you and until next time, I'm your host, Lorraine Schneider.